The pre-Hispanic city of Teotihuacan is located 50 kilometers from Mexico City. Built between the 1st century BC and the 7th century AD, Teotihuacan is characterized by the great dimensions of its monuments and by their geometric and symbolic layout. At the peak of its development, the city stretched out over 36 square kilometers from the ceremonial center, which, despite its vast dimensions, represented only 10% of the city's total surface area. Among the different ethnic groups which populated ancient Mexico, the Totonacs always claimed to have built the city, and the Aztecs, who arrived here much later, after the city's destruction and abandonment around 650 AD, perpetuated this story. They claimed to be the Totonac successors on an intellectual and cultural level. In fact, the sacrifices carried out here every 20 years under the reign of the Aztec leader Moctezuma reveals that ancient beliefs persisted about Teotihuacan as a sacred place, the place where gods are created. The Avenue of the Dead crosses the city from south to north and runs to the Pyramid of the Moon. The 46-meter high pyramid is the result of many superimposed monuments. Archaeologists have identified no less than seven phases of construction, which were undertaken every 52 years. This cycle corresponds to the synchronization of the religious calendar and the earthly calendar. By digging tunnels in the pyramid, archaeologists discovered tombs containing bodies that were most likely sacrificed. Their hands are tied behind their backs, and their tombs contain many offerings. Before the structure stands the Plaza of the Moon, lined with platforms that follow a rigorously symmetrical pattern. The platforms may have been devoted to various sub-divinities, and religious ceremonies were likely held in the temples overlooking the platforms. The buildings on the site were naturally decorated with mural paintings representing aspects of their vision of the world and their environment at the time. The Aztecs, like their predecessors, worshipped the sun, the rain, the moon and many other deities. Furthermore, they observed the stars. From its central access, the site of Teotihuacan is divided into four quadrants. This symbolic representation of the world summarizes the astral religion of the nomads and the agrarian religion of sedentary peoples. To the left of the Avenue of the Dead stands the greatest pyramid of the site, the Pyramid of the Sun. Completed in the year 150 AD, it is 65 meters high. Its two levels stand on a square terrace spanning 350 meters in width, and it has a volume of one million cubic meters. The temple that stood at its peak has disappeared. Contrary to many other Mesoamerican pyramids, it was for the most part built in a single phase. The pyramid was erected atop a cave, for caves played an important role in the religious systems of the pre-Hispanic peoples. They were a symbol of fertility, the place from which man emerged, but they also gave access to the underworld, to the dead. Standing before these poised buildings, we understand why, in the 15th century, the Aztecs appropriated this abandoned, majestic site. The site had what it took to satisfy the ambitions of the Aztecs, who claimed to be the sons of the sun, descended on earth to lead the world. Like their predecessors, the Aztecs regularly came here to pay tribute to the divinities. They practiced human sacrifice as well as cannibalism. The sacrifices, which were numerous, constantly required new victims, and the Aztecs undertook expeditions to obtain prisoners of war. But the victims could also be consenting members of the population, for religious belief had it that the sacrificial victims would enjoy an enviable fate. Each divinity had its particular sacrificial ritual, some required that the heart be torn out for the sun to rise each morning. Others required that children be drowned for the rain to be abundant. And yet others called for skinning, in honor of the god of renewal and vegetation. Going up the Avenue of the Dead, beyond the intersection with the East-West Avenue, stands a huge complex that archaeologists call the Citadel. 
The complex occupies a surface of 16 hectares, and its 400-meter-long surrounding wall gives it the appearance of a citadel, although it did not serve as a defending structure. Since trade was very developed in the empire, it may have been a great marketplace for trading of all sorts. At the back of the site stands the Temple of the Winged Serpent, still called the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. It is a small pyramid flanked by a small esplanade before it. The Temple of the Winged Serpent is the last great structure to be built in Teotihuacan. The sides are decorated with undulating winged serpents, and on the vertical panels, reptile heads jutting out from ruffs of feathers alternate with hard-to-define geometric-like sculptings. This work required considerable means, for each head weighs no less than four tons. At the time of the city's peak, these sculptures were painted. Teotihuacan was abandoned in the 7th century, perhaps following a popular revolt against the leading class. Redeveloped for a time by the Aztecs in the 15th century, it fell into oblivion once again after the arrival of the conquistadors in the 16th century. Today, it is one of the most visited archaeological sites of Mexico. In France, 30 minutes away from Paris, the Chateau de Rambouillet is a former royal and presidential residence located within a magnificent 100-hectare park, part of the forest of the same name. In 1368, Jean Bernier, an advisor to King Charles V, bought an ancient manor that he transformed into a fortified castle surrounded by moats. The large tower is its final witness. From the 14th to 17th centuries, the chateau becomes the property of the Dangen family, one of whom, Jacques, was a close friend of King Francis I during the Renaissance. Later, in the 18th century, the legitimized natural son of Louis XIV will conduct major works there, hoping to own a hunting estate near to Paris. The chateau has a lovely brick and stone architecture with facades punctuated by dormers with brick pediments and pointed turrets. The interior arrangement of the assembly apartment, for the most part still in place, is very luxurious. Originally, the Count of Toulouse dedicated the first room to his wife. It should be noted that the very beautiful but equally fragile Rococo and Neo-Pompeian interior decorations of this residence can only be seen on accompanied visits. Each of these adjoining rooms is entirely covered by sculpted paneling, made by the ornamentalists François-Antoine Vasset and Jacques Verbert. A chimney carries the royal emblems. The perspective finishes at the mistress of the house's boudoir. Next, King Louis XVI will fall in love with the Chateau de Rambouillet, and after him, Napoleon I. Both of them adored hunting, so they will refurnish the other wings of the sovereign dwelling, in a more somber style this time. Later, Rambouillet will be highly appreciated by Napoleon I in the beginning of the 19th century. Then, in the 20th century, the chateau will become one of the residences of the presidents of the French Republic, used to welcome foreign heads of state. Not long ago, it was turned into a museum. Here,
time has no hold over history. The great prestigious dining room on the first floor was the former king's bedchamber in the 18th century. On the wall, there are two tapestries from the famous New Indies tenture of the Gobelin workshop, the Indian hunter and the negress carried in a hammock. This series of tapestries evokes the nature of Brazil, the New Indies of the time. It is a revised Brazil, redesigned to correspond to the idea of the new world that they had at the time. The kings used these tapestries to make diplomatic gifts and to spread the art and expertise of the French. Here is where we grasp the full historical continuity of the Chateau de Rambouillet. The upper room of this large tower where King Francis I died on March 31, 1547 will serve as the living quarters for prestigious guests visiting France in the 20th century. The Chateau de Rambouillet was, for example, the site of the first meeting of the summit of the most industrialized countries in 1975. In 1999, the Rambouillet Agreement was written there, a peace proposition between Yugoslavia and Kosovo. The Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, and Nelson Mandela also spent time here. You have to climb the little staircase to reach the Holy of Holies, what we call the Francis I Room. So this is the bed in which the greatest foreign heads of state have slept. The bust of the king is, of course, prominently placed in the room. The Renaissance-era furniture was acquired through various purchases. As for the garden, Florio de Menonville, who bought the chateau from the Angen family, lavished a colossal sum on the development of the park. For a start, he is the one who transformed the French formal gardens and created a series of lakes fed by the numerous springs in this swampy area. The pier is the starting point for all the pathways of the garden. Canals were dug along the six islands, formerly accessible by boat or gondola. The park is enlivened by sculptures created by Simon Mazière, Pierre Le Gros, and René Fremont. The son of the Count of Toulouse, the Duke of Pontièvre, will also invest in the garden. He developed 25 hectares of the English landscape park with the construction of follies. This is in the fashion of the return to nature. Here, this art of living born of the Enlightenment is carried out with pomp. The Shell Cottage was constructed in 1779 for the Princesse de Lamballe, the daughter-in-law of the Duke. The interior decoration breaks with a rustic exterior. This is the goal of a folly, to surprise the visitor. Even the mirror is made of pearl, which blurs the image. Louis XVI had bought Rambouillet from his cousin because he loved hunting. But Marie Antoinette did not like the place because of the sound made by the thousands of toads that lived in this former marshland. So it's in order to make her like the estate that, in the greatest secrecy, the king had this magnificent dairy built, and it is unveiled in 1787. At the dawn of the French Revolution, the dairy reflects the idealized return to nature advocated by the Age of Enlightenment. Two years later, the French Revolution thunders. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette will be decapitated, and the Rambouillet domain will become a national property and begin a new career, Republican this time.
In the southern Peloponnese, in 1204, the Fourth Crusade changed its original goal, and the Crusaders captured and pillaged Constantinople. Then, the Byzantine Empire was divided among the new emperor, the Venetians, and the Crusaders. The Peloponnese was given to Geoffroy de Villardouin, who then controlled Sparta and its region to settle down there. In order to ensure the security of his palace, Geoffroy's son, Guillaume, had a castle built on one of the surrounding hills. Thus, Mistras was born. The forest and its ramparts were completed in 1249. Later, Mistras was governed by the sons and brothers of the Byzantine emperors. It even became the second biggest city of the empire after Constantinople. It was a great center of philosophical studies, attracting numerous intellectuals who influenced Renaissance Italy in the 15th century. Raised to the ground by the Turks during the Greek War of Independence in 1825, the ancient Byzantine city was totally abandoned. In 1989, the ruins of the fortress and the palace, the numerous remaining churches and monasteries, were listed on UNESCO's World Heritage List. On the slopes of the promontory, touching Byzantine churches display their tumultuous history among the cypress and olive groves. Along the surrounding wall of the lower city, the buildings that make up the church of the metropolis date back to the late 13th century, soon after the completion of the fortress. Nisiphorus had it built after having purchased the surrounding lands and houses. The style is characteristic of this time, with its stones surrounded by a row of bricks. The church was enhanced in the late 15th century, and its domes reveal the Byzantine influence. The vaults of the ground floor are the originals. This basilica, dedicated to Saint Demetrius, is divided into three naves by two rows of three columns. The central nave is much higher than the two others. It leads to a traditional Byzantine altar where Jesus Christ, the Virgin, and the Apostles are sanctified. The paintings date back to the last decades of the 13th century and the first half of the 14th century. They have retained their rich colors despite their old age. The monastery of Pantanasa is the best preserved building of Mistras, and also the only one which is still occupied today by a half dozen nuns. It was founded by Jean Frangopoulos, minister in 1424. The Frangopoulos were an important family of Mistras, of Latin origin but Hellenized with time. Indeed, the family's name indicates its origins, since Frango means Frank. The Frankish influence is clearly seen in the bell tower. Its trilobed windows are framed by Gothic arches, and four small towers flank the dome at the peak. The facades include two rows of windows on the apses. They are narrow and Gothic on the lower level, and bigger on the upper level. The church is a basilica with three naves on the first level, but its roof is topped with five domes. The original frescoes were completed by others in the 17th century. For the noble families of Mistras, building a church or a basilica was a way of affirming their status. And for those who were not aristocrats but became wealthy, it was a way to try to climb the social ladder. Mm -hmm. 
which explains why we encounter a lot of churches on this Byzantine site. This monastery is the last great building of the Byzantine period built in Mistras. It is a beautiful example of Mistras's 15th century architecture, with a combination of three traditions, local, Byzantine, and Frankish. Among the ruins and the numerous churches on the slopes of the hill stands the ancient palace of the region's leaders. It is a complex of buildings dating from different periods composed of two wings in the shape of an L. Here, at the edge of the lower city, the monastery of Peribleptos and its church were built on the face of the cliff in the prolongation of a cave. A part of the buildings are in ruins. But others are in a perfect state notably the Catholicon, the convent's church. The uncommon location of this monastery is explained by the fact that a more ancient place of Christian worship had been established in the cave. The monastery was built in the 14th century with the goal of developing the primitive altar. The Frankish influence is revealed by the fleur de lys that are seen in many areas engraved on the apses. The church stands against a rocky cliff and the apses seem to jut out from the rock. The church is designed on a Greek cross plan with a dome supported by four pillars. Here, too, the walls and ceilings are covered in frescoes, which are pretty well preserved. They depict Christ, the Apostles, and the Virgin Mary. Among the paintings, a strange nativity scene depicts Mary lying down, facing us and turning her back on Jesus in a wooden cradle. The church is flanked with chapels in which you can also admire frescoes. We have little information about the ruins of Mistress, but they nonetheless procure a beautiful mystical voyage. The city of Rome in Italy has been at the heart of history since the time of ancient Rome. Over many centuries, the different leaders and different traditions built many monuments which have survived throughout the ages. They bear precious testimony to this past. Rome is truly an open sky museum. The city has preserved its architectural homogeneity. Industrialization and modernism did not create any hiccups here. The city has preserved its charm and various styles coexist. The Piazza Navona was built on the ruins of the Stadium of Domitian, which stood here in the first century. Created during the Renaissance, it has preserved its exact shape. It is the greatest tourist spot in the Italian capital. With its monumental architectural decor and its fountains, it is one of the most beautiful Baroque monuments of Rome. It is said to be the third most beautiful square in the world. Furthermore, it is one of the city's main tourist areas, full of restaurants, terraces, artists, and street performances. Indeed, it is a good place for a stroll. South of the square, the Moor Fountain was designed by Bernini and created by Giacomo della Porta in 1576. The fountain represents a Moor fighting a dolphin. 
Some say that it is a portrait of Bernini himself. This moor is surrounded by tritons blowing in shells and sculptures pouring water from the upper basin to the lower basin. To the north, the fountain of Neptune is also by Giacomo della Porta. The sculpture was modified in the late 19th century. The central figure of Neptune fighting an octopus was then added. Around the fountain, naiads, cherubins, and seahorses abound. But the most beautiful fountain is certainly that of the four rivers in the center of the square. It was built by Bernini himself in 1550. The four rivers it represents each symbolize a continent. At that time, the continent of Oceana had not yet been discovered. It is topped with an obelisk that was found in the ancient ruins of Rome. Among the many fountains of Rome, the Trevi Fountain is the meeting spot par excellence of lovers and couples who want to have children. Legend has it that its name derives from a girl named Trevi, who preserved her virginity by designating the site of this spring. Built in the 18th century, it is a continuation of Baroque architecture. At its peak, the four statues represent the four seasons. At its feet stands an allegory to the four rivers. The central niche shelters the god of the sea, Neptune, flanked by the statues of abundance and salubrity. The custom in leaving Rome is to throw a coin with your right hand while turning your back on the fountain. This superstition draws in nearly 1 million euros per year to various charity organizations in the city. Via del Corso gives out onto the Piazza del Popolo, which means the people square. At the center stands an Egyptian obelisk from Heliopolis. Brought to Italy under the reign of Augustus, it was placed on this square in 1589. The square was a site of public executions. It is surrounded by three churches and two Baroque-style fountains. Among these churches, Santa Maria del Popolo stands out. This old 11th century chapel was extended and rebuilt many times over, notably by Bernini in the 17th century. The Piazza di Spagna is another main tourist site of Rome. In 1620, Spain took over this square to establish its embassy beside the Holy See. In the 17th century, the area around the embassy was even considered Spanish territory. In 1854, Pope Pius IX had the ancient column of the Immaculate Conception built here. Thanks to its numerous hotels, it is a very cosmopolitan spot. A majestic monumental staircase rises from the square. It was inaugurated in 1725. Made of marble and built in late Baroque style by the architect Francesco de Sanctis, it numbers 138 steps on three levels. A series of widening and shrinking ramps amplify the perception of height. The staircase is commonly used as a hangout spot. It attracts tourists as well as the local population, who use it as a meeting spot you can enjoy a nice view of the city from there. In 1789, an obelisk was placed before the church that is located at the top of the staircase. The 
the Trinity of the Mounts is a beautiful French church that was built in the 16th century. Its facade with two bell towers displays the Renaissance style. The privileged site of the Trinity of the Mounts above the Piazza di Espagna makes it a well-known spot in Rome. St. Petersburg is the second greatest city in Russia after Moscow. Founded in 1703 by the Tsar Peter the Great, St. Petersburg is resolutely modern thanks to its urban design and architecture. The new city was to enable Russia to open a window on Europe, and it was to help Russia rise to the rank of the great European powers in line with the Tsar's wishes. Today, the city is listed on UNESCO's World Heritage List. The Peter and Paul Fortress is the site of the city's historical foundation in 1703. It is located on the small island of Hares nestled in the meandering waters of the Neva. Speedily built during the Great Northern War against Sweden, it illustrates the military purpose of the new city. To stabilize its marshy soil, more than 40,000 stilts were required to establish the first wooden construction of the first citadel, which was rebuilt in stone a few years later. Behind the ramparts and the gates, the fortress shelters many buildings, including the Peter and Paul Cathedral built between 1712 and 1733. It has a 123-meter high bell tower and also stands on the site of a former wooden church. It is one of the oldest monuments in the city. It was built in Baroque style, following the plans of the Swiss architect Domenico Trezzini. Inside, the word Baroque takes on all its meaning. Pink and almond green colors are seen alongside the gildings. The decorations are incredibly rich. The exuberant iconostasis contains 49 beautiful icons. The cathedral contains many luxurious decorations, but it is also the burial site of all the Russian emperors and their families since the time of Peter the Great. They were all buried here, except for Peter II, buried in Moscow, and Ivan VI, who was assassinated in prison following a coup and whose burial site is unknown. All of the tombs are made of white Carrare marble, except for two, the tombs of Alexander II and his wife Maria of Hesse-Darmstadt, which are different. Maria's tomb is made of pink rondite from the Ural Mountains, while Alexander II's is made of green jasper from the Altai Mountains. The two tombs were each sculpted from a single block. The coffins are thus located below the tombs, not inside them as the other coffins are. Currently, the cathedral contains 50 coffins, 46 of which are from the Romanov family. The tombs of Peter, Alexander, Catherine, Nicholas, and Elizabeth retrace the entire history of Imperial Russia.
The fortress also contains the Trubetskoy Bastion. Founded in 1720, it was used as a barracks, but it was quickly turned into prison for important figures. Among the first prisoners was the eldest son of Peter the Great. He was imprisoned and tortured here until his death. Later, in the 19th century, revolutionary intellectuals were also detained here. Among them, the writers Dostoevsky and Gorky. Lenin's older brother, too. This is said to have motivated him in the role he later played in the Russian Revolution in the early 20th century. Among the fortress's buildings, the commander's house has become the city's history museum. Besides the scale models, the house has preserved all the elements of the barracks commander's home as well as testimonies of the city's great historical moments. A plethora of accessories reminds the visitor that the lifestyles of 19th and 20th century Russia were not so different from that of the Western world. The neoclassic mint building also had its place within the fortress. This is where currency was manufactured under the czars. Today, the building serves to produce commemorative pieces, medallions, and decorations. The fortress is exited by its sole bridge, the same one through which all the supplies necessary to daily life passed, behind these walls flanked by 12 bastions. The Neva Gate, which gives access to the bridge, was nicknamed the Gate of Death for prisoners passed through the gate before being imprisoned for life or executed. Today, it is a popular spot among couples. As we can see, the city of St. Petersburg is loaded with history greatest according to the size of its population. The second Russian port on the Baltic Sea, it is also a major center of Russian industry, research, and teaching, as well as an important European cultural center. After the communist period, the city reappropriated its imperial past, and along with it, it opened itself towards the West, to the great joy of visitors who can come discover a rich heritage worthy of real interest. Nara was the first capital of Japan between 710 and 784. Prior to that, the capitals were moved from kingdom to kingdom because, according to the ancient beliefs of Shintoism, death constituted the most serious impurity. And the death of a ruler meant that impurity struck the entire capital. So the palaces had to be destroyed and built elsewhere. In the early 8th century, the Japanese understood that they had to create a more durable center for government and state administration. So they established their capital here, especially since Buddhism had appeared in the archipelago, creating new needs. The historical monuments of ancient Nara are among the most ancient in Japan, and they have been on UNESCO's World Heritage List since 1998. Kofukuji Temple is accessed by a staircase that leads to a small octagonal pavilion. It was built on the north side of the main building in 721 and it was rebuilt 700 years later. In Japanese Buddhist temples, there are three main buildings. The pagoda, generally three to five floors, which is absent in Zen Buddhism, The main building, called Kondo, literally Golden Hall, which was sometimes linked to the pagoda by a cloister called Cairo. In the park, as well as throughout the city, deer roam free, in peace and quiet. 
In Shinto religion, deer are considered the messenger of the gods. According to legend, a divinity seated on a winged white buck landed close to here to ensure the protection of the newly built imperial city. Since then, deer are considered as divine animals, protectors of Nara and of all of Japan. Until 1637, anyone who killed a deer was condemned to death. Today, there are more than 1,000 deer in Nara that beg tourists for food. At the time of Nara, Chinese civilization had a great influence over Japan. Thus, the administration modeled itself after the vast, centralized, and powerful Chinese bureaucracy. The same went for religion, and Buddhism flourished in the archipelago. It was a time during which the great constructions of Buddhist temples became widespread. These great temples had a very big impact on the population, who saw in this new religion a source of powerful protection for the country. Throughout this temple and up to the exit, monumentality is truly emphasized. As soon as it was founded during the Nara period, Todaiji, literally the Great Temple of the East, served to concentrate the different Buddhist sects of Japan. Within its surrounding wall stands the largest wooden construction in the world, Daibutsu Den, the Hall of the Great Buddha. Its entrance is protected by frightening celestial guardians. Inside stands a huge bronze statue of the Buddha, the Enlightened One, rising 15 meters high. It displays the most sophisticated head of sculpted hair in the archipelago, with more than 100 bronze hair curls. The right hand is raised in a sign of appeasement. Beside the Buddha, the two wooden gilded bodhisattvas are meant to help reach enlightenment. Outside, a statue of the prophet dissipates all ills if you rub it before leaving. 14 kilometers south of Nara is Horiyoji, literally, the temple of the flourishing law. It is a part of the monuments built in the 7th century, and it is among the oldest wooden buildings existing in the world. These architectural masterpieces marked an important point in the history of art. They illustrate the adaptation of Chinese Buddhist architecture in Japanese culture. Here, too, the Neos guard the entrance to the temple. The one with an open mouth represents the expression of power, while the one with a closed mouth symbolizes latent power. The most ancient buildings of the religious complex after the gate are the Kondo and the five-story pagoda. The temple's main building is the sacred edifice which contains the statues of the Buddha. Entrance is strictly prohibited. Contrary to China, in Japan, pagodas are made of wood and built around a shinbashira. It's a thick central pillar that ensures the stability of the monument despite earthquakes. Multi-storied without a staircase, built on a pedestal and topped by an arrow or a spike, they are displayed as artistic objects made to be admired. Pagodas are the most important structures in Buddhist temples for they hold the relics of the Buddha. The Kairo, a covered corridor that stretches east and west, surrounding the pagoda and the main building, is used like the cloisters of Western Christian pagodas. Within the temple's compound stands an octagonal structure, the oldest of its kind in Japan. It is the Pavilion of Dreams, which owes its name to a legend. The Prince of Nara saw a celestial nymph in his dreams, and she enlightened him on the mystery of a sutra the sutras being the texts of the teachings attributed to the Buddha. Inside, a statue of Bodhisattva has remained hidden for over a thousand years in order to preserve its power. On the other side of the compound stands the Pavilion of Studies, the Kodo. It was built for the monks who studied Buddhism. 
they followed teachings that insisted on the fact that there is no reality outside of thought, for the senses produce only illusions. Further away, a temple is devoted to the temple's founder, Prince Shotoku, who lived from 574 to 622. He promulgated the first national constitution of Japan, and he also made enormous efforts to promote the spread of Buddhism. But in Nara, religion became very omnipresent over time and very constricting for the imperial government. Thus, he decided to leave the city and all its temples and to move the capital to Kyoto. The waterfalls of Iguazu are located in the middle of the tropical forest of South America, at the border between Brazil and Argentina. They are one of the natural wonders and were listed a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1984. They are not waterfalls, strictly speaking, but a group of 275 cascades forming a semicircle over nearly three kilometers. The name Iguazu means big water in the language of the Guarani people. The group of cascades pours out up to 6 million liters of water per second. The first European to have contemplated these cascades was the explorer Alvar Núñez de Cabeza de Vaca, who ventured into this luxuriant jungle in 1540. Today, the majority of the falls lie within Argentine territory. Many tour paths were created in the forest, above the various branches of the river. And thanks to footbridges, it is possible to get within only a few meters of the waterfalls. Each cascade has its own name, like Two Sisters, Chico and Ramirez, for example. With a deafening noise, the multiple cascades produce great clouds made up of water droplets, and these constantly humidify the many islands on the river and the neighboring forests. This creates a microclimate that is extremely favorable to a luxuriant and dense subtropical vegetation that contains a very diverse flora and fauna. Over 2,000 plant species live among the region's common animals. Tapirs, giant anteaters, howler monkeys, ocelots, jaguars, and caimans. On both sides of the falls, the Brazilian and Argentine governments have created national parks. These parks have also been registered on UNESCO's World Heritage List. Besides the footbridges reserved for the bravest of visitors, it is possible to take a boat to the foot of the falls. A raincoat is required here, as is the dexterity of the pilot for he must work with the power of the water's current. After the lower Argentinian path, there is the upper path. The layout of the paths through the forest lets one enjoy a panoramic view of the falls and some viewpoints are established at the edge of the falls, giving visitors a perspective of their vertical height and an electrifying shiver. There is a succession of balconies from which we can see the different cascades. The Salto dos Hernanas, Boy, Ramirez, Bosetti, Adam and Eve, Bernabe Mendez, and the Mibigua, or the Salto San Martin. 
Iguazu Falls are fed by the eponymous river which forms the border between Brazil and Argentina. It joins the Parana River 23 kilometers downstream from the falls. It is a very large river, between 500 and 1,000 meters wide, and it widens even more as it nears the falls, before falling into a tectonic fault 80 meters below in some areas. The highest cataract reaches a height of 90 meters. It is named the Garganta del Diablo, the throat of the devil. Its majestic power has led it to serve as the setting of many movies. Indeed, this waterfall looks like a gigantic funnel that is ready to engulf the world. The footbridges that lead to the observational balconies over the throat of the devil enable visitors to approach and embrace this environment, created by the waterfalls amidst the forest. But this environment is threatened by many projects to install dams upstream. Dams would be a death sentence for this very special ecosystem. The nearby deforestation is also a cause for concern. The Brazilian side offers a different view of the falls, especially from the footbridges that have been put in place there. The volume and the level of the water varies according to the seasons. Furthermore, it can carry great tree trunks ripped out from the banks upstream by the tumultuous waters. The footbridges allow you to get as close as possible to the falls in complete safety. They are high enough to avoid being submerged and strong enough to resist floating wreckage. These footbridges are a true success for tourism. Nature enthusiasts will find an original place at Iguazu Falls worthy of interest. The wild beauty of the site assuredly makes for a heavenly setting and even gives us an image of Earth as it might have been before man attempted to tame it. <laughs>